first um, person I'd like to ask to come up, if he's in the room, is Andy V. Frost. Friends in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Malden boy. Oh, yeah. Now, Malden in the 20s was a village, and then the underground arrived. So I'm a new town boy, but uh, the underground has played a big part of my life. This is the Northern Line. <laughs> that black line running deep beneath London runs deep in me. Deeper than a line I could draw with my finger in the filthy wooden sills of 38 stock before grandmothers or mothers slap could stop me in my tracks. Deeper than the wandle, flowing below and beside New Merton Bull Mills. My father worked there under the shadow of that ugly grey tower block, Collier's Wood. Deeper than the foundations. For the flyovers and roadworks of the North Circular at Staples Corner and the start of the M1 where my grandfather travelled to for so long via Edgeware to repair the trench diggers and pile drivers that made them. Deeper than screen free at the Piccadilly Plaza with a late night showing of a good new film to Ice and Cherry, a great day out around Sco Soho and Leicester Square. Deeper than the poetry that I travel into here in Soho, sorry, in Northern or Central, East End or West End, before drinking long and deep into the night with like minded friends. That black line running deep beneath London runs deep in me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andy Frost. Okay, I'd like to ask uh, Leo Garza, please. Leo Garza. Hi, I'm Leo. Um, I'm Mexican, just in case you're wondering. Leo is short for Leonardo. It's, it's like, yeah. I mean, gender binary is stupid, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had no idea that I was supposed to, like, well, I'm allowed to have more than one poem because, like, um, when I came to sign up, he just kept talking, but when I get nervous, I can't hear. <laughs> um, so this first one is the one that a friend of mine told me to perform. Uh, it's about my... Okay, I'm not going to give spoilers. It's about a tube of toothpaste. And I wrote it after my sister told me that I only ever wrote about complex things, so I should write about something simple. And then this poem made me realize I can't write about anything simple. So, here's a letter to a half-used tube of toothpaste. Dear half-used tube of toothpaste, I left at my girlfriend's house. I'm sorry I left you like that. Somewhere between new and used, between started and finished, between wanted and no longer wanted, between cared for and never touched again, dear half-used tube of toothpaste, I left at my girlfriend's house. Forgive me for leaving you capless, left to die until your expiration date, having yet to suffer through getting used once by my girlfriend when I didn't kiss her for three weeks, begging you to taste like my mouth again. Dear half-used tube of toothpaste, I left in my girlfriend's house. I'm sorry that you will have to suffer through seeing me once for an instant when I come back and walk past the bathroom door she left ajar. Having you to experience the sound of my ignored apology texts be the soundtrack to her crying. Having yet to experience never seeing me again. Having yet to experience her sister throwing you out as a way to keep her from suffering. Then you will die. And for that, I'm sorry. Dear half-used tube of toothpaste, I left at my soon-to-be ex-girlfriend's house. I want you to know I meant to break up with her since I left you there. I want you to know I did my best to keep her from suffering. I only left her once I knew, once I knew that she knew that the happiness I was feeding her came from her own plate. I left as soon as she stopped believing that she was a bird with broken wings and realized she was never broken at all. I didn't come into her life to fix her. I came into her life to guide her into realizing that she had stared at her veins for so long that they threatened to pour something out. Dear soon to be dead, half used tube of toothpaste, I left at my soon to be ex-girlfriend's house. I'm sorry. 
dear soon-to-be ex-girlfriend. I promise I cannot commit to anything. I say mint tea is my favorite, but I always drink black. I say forget-me-nots are my favorite flowers, but I always buy daisies. I said I'd always love you, but I guess that wasn't true. I'm sorry that you were a stepping stone to realizing my potential. I'm sorry that I had to step on your heart to get there. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But may no force but the force of Earth stop your heartbeat. I loved you, and for that, I'm sorry. Okay, and then once I realized there was more than one poem, I kind of just like went through all my stuff and freaked out. So, uh, this is a, um, okay, this poem I just read was kind of serious, right? And so is this one, but I'm not a serious person. I'm like very happy, I just wanted you to know that. Um, this poem I wrote about a year ago, almost, and it is for a friend of mine named Margaret. And, uh, yeah, let me just find it real quick. It's, I do a lot of movement in this poem because I kind of keeps me in the mood for it. Yeah. <laughs> City lights, oh wait, it's, a, it's in New York. <laughs> City lights, shining bright, cars rush under the windowsill, her toes were peeking, trying to see where this is going, trying to see where everyone is rushing to, she dived. Face first. She landed. Face first. The concrete broke that nose that everyone wanted. Scratches along her wrist, they looked like lines in poetry. She experienced sonnets over haikus, over odes to the Lord. The thing about Maggie is, she is so much more than her suicide, but that's everything that I write her for. She is so much more. She is so much more. She is her hair, and she is her nose, and she is her laughter, but she is also more than superficial. She is more than physical. She is metaphysical. She is the side of me that is never happy, the side that never sees the light at the end of the tunnel, because if Ma for Maggie, the light at the end of the tunnel was a casket that was tinted in her own blood, drawn from her own hand. Maggie, this is for you. This is for my bunkmate. This is for the youngest death I've had to face. This is for the first suicide. Maggie, this is not how it's supposed to end. You were supposed to go through puberty and make your own business. You were supposed to inspire others. You were supposed to be another it gets better story, Maggie, sometimes. I understand how you felt. I understand why you said you had no friends. I understand why you said your family didn't love you. I understand why you did what you did, but Maggie, there was no need for you to write poetry on your wrists with that kind of ink. There was no need for you to step out of your window so carelessly. There was no need for you to do your best to stop doing anything. There was no need for you to drown your sorrows in bleach, Maggie. Listen, I've been through similar things for a while now. I felt like my soul is a car in traffic on a hot summer tsunami. I felt the comfort of depression. I felt like the blade is a parent who just knows where to kiss you and make the pain go away. I felt like chronic pain is similar to depression in the sense that sometimes all you need is to take enough pills so that the pain goes away. Maggie, this is for you. This is for everything you taught me. This is for my bunkmate. This is for the youngest to the side. Maggie, you are... Sorry. Maggie, you were... So much more. Okay, cool. This one, I have, it's not, it's actually like a pretty happy poem, so I guess that's why I'm reading it to you, just because like, I feel like I made everyone bummed out. <laughs> um, this actually has a lot of connections with like, okay, so Margaret has a lot of connections with a friend of mine and Melanie. They've never met before, they never will, obviously, and um, this poem is for Melanie. She's one of my best friends, and I think one of the people I've loved the most ever. She's the priest. Um, yeah, that's cool. Joy is the old pseudonym of my best friend. Joy would be entertained by her own image in the computer screen. Joy would find kindness in the way the anemone waves at the bottom of the ocean. Joy was always wise. Wise would know the importance of men with guns. Wise wouldn't be disgusted by their actions, but knew no difference between being rebellious and suicidal. 
Wise is human now, in a way it's taken me a while to understand. Human that has skin that tears and body that bleeds. Human that has kind eyes and long sleeves. Human who is quick to learn that something that hurts can be something that heals unless you cut your way around it. There's never been a person I have loved so consistently than she who has guided me through example. That was a very happy Leo Garza, thank you. Gillespie Robertson, please. The great she elephant came before, then went and returned and broke war. And if they said none might endure, the great grim war and others saw. Who sat as a satyr, not knowing if she was rich or poor, to tell of victory or defeat concerning her. Some were limp and lifeless in those times, as if all knew that saw those things of visual suggestion and none knew who, and subtle prisons were visited upon them, the corpses that came unknown, giving in to strangers to give up and down, including their chastity. So she forgets me in the morning. If Father Abraham was a righteous man and the Fuhrer as well, King Dreadlock say one thing there, and I man say another. For well, sometimes King Ja fight in a different way to some, concerning vitalization, so then absas. And then the decree, but who ordained it? If it was not obtained, that was destroyed to be changed, and changed again, that should not have been made strange. So then vocal thoughts and certain doings were done, of course, and then the deeds of the dead were done, concerning ancient symbols and mysterious lunacy and the shades of light that can go forth to be reconciled. And then the eternal, and then concerning the eternal vibrations of the antique, modern and cos ancient cosmic spirit, with the scientific explanations of the impossible, and the impossible explanations of the scientific, ergo cogitus sum, as if she were a strange lady, an interesting emblem of a wasted empire, by whom we ask, as she does decree, so then she said she is not an interesting lady, of course, who can interpret fully, perhaps maybe, for they came with craven force in unexpected places. Ergo the fame that does decree the shame, ergo again the ways of the game. So did the knight declaim. There is no music here, perhaps. So perhaps perforce, rhyme on, sweet lady. Perhaps perforce, perhaps, visible and secret melody. So hello, how it go, sometimes when, sometimes then. So then, when if it go then, it go to continue and pass on, so not. Back to darkness and the living undersea night, pleasant madness and musics of powdered grey, worthy women folk that none can see, knowing not their wisdom, questioning their friends, having good times and hard times, as if fools did rain in another's kingdom bringing forth the theories of blindness and sight, as if another thing that may, uh, as if another thing were possible, it may have been foolish from the start, some might say, concerning the affairs of the physician and figures made from their relics. So we bring our humble offerings to the muses, the graces and the furies. Is it possible? Is what impossible, sir? It depends, we observe, got to be insured, but where or what is insurance? Madman meets monk, mustn't mock monk, madman, sir. He may become a potent priest, and you'll be blamed and restrained by the hordesmen of weak waters, stealing the drinks to perpetuate folly in some individuals. Mock his enemies so that they should be sane, yet you say all are fools in these times, fascinating theories. Take it and grow a garden of herbs with it, but if you are not kind to the herbs, they may mock your madness for folly, and insane you may remain against your friends, as is the way with many. That's it. Thank you, Gersby Robertson. And our last uh, open mic um, spot tonight is the uh, 
wonderfully named Lantern Carrier. Thank you. Love touched me. It was so powerful, my breath became suspended. My heart shed blissful tears. I had not previously experienced the sweetness, and I was taken aback. In my drunken haze, I tried to comprehend this music, mesmerizing the alcove of my being. Alas, it was to no avail, for a compelling delight silenced the intellect and calmed my soul. I saw myself emanating rhythms from the majesty of the sun. A pulsating light took hold of my darkness, smashing it into a trillion fragments. I swooned in reverie, intoxicated by the chalice of my eternal home. Words, they can feel like a scalpel, an epitome of despair, or cute little angels and beams of light. Sometimes they enter or cool like darts, or shine like magic lanterns in the apertures of heaven. Words, orchestrated by a gifted wordsmith, revive the present of scented Giora on the wet shrubs of a bard, and fall in a silken tassel of glory and grace. I hear the sweet humming of the nightingales, the enchanting songs of redbreasts. They remind me of a tapestry of eloquence, the immersive sublimity of psalms unparalleled. O oh, lover, your glorious embrace shines with the rays of moonbeams, and I am stunned with amazement by your charismatic charm. When I listen to the cadences of my fragrant angel, I hear the melody of minstrels, songs of golden showers falling upon the wind, flooding and nurturing my inner temple. It is then that I pull the moon down, which shines like a beacon in my darkness. Seraphim, sunbeams, and twinkling stars kiss my breath endearingly with the delight and my being thrills with an ecstatic pulse, celebrating the splendor of inner rhapsody. Sweet love, I felt the de depth of your supernal rain, dousing the very flames of Hades, your words floating on the windows of my soul. I soared like an eagle to the edge of a resplendent light, floating in ecstasy on the crest of a scarlet crimson crimson-hued horizon, bathing and dancing with your naked silhouette, my queen. Come into my heart, O oh lover. Let your lusted beauty continue to glimmer, even in my abyss of despair. Your words like velvet glue, sealing the cracks of my inner sanctum, carrying a carousel of beautiful lamps, shining with the opulence of silence offering an unspoken sweetness to the soul. Uh, well, that was Mr. Lantern Carrier shining a very strong light there, so thank you. Mr. And um, if I could ask all the open mic uh, readers tonight to leave uh, emails with us before, before you go in the evening. Um, I'll continue now, and 